Welcome to Matters Financial, the geopolitical from a frontier. Thanks kindly for stopping by. I apologise for my absence last week, but I'll tell you about where I went. I'd like to uh, give a big thank you to Charles Island of East African Breweries for a wonderfully incisive mind speak. Put up a photograph of the two of us, um, and I was just going through the tweets again, and uh, it really was very interesting. A very win win attitude saying that, you know, when he looks at East Africa, Nairobi, Kampala, Dar es Salaam, I see the future. Um, paid 43 billion shillings of taxes last year. Uh, um, he thinks that Tusca Lager has the potential to be an internationally appreciated brand. I agree with him there. Currently the seventh most successful brand in Africa. Um, saying do great business is, is about systemizing everything. He's referring to his wife and apparently he's going through a midlife crisis because he's bought a motorbike and his wife said as long as you have a machine and not on another woman, that's fine. Um, talk about local sourcing, seeking to keep more of the funds in the region. Um, Two million customers reaching adulthood in East Africa annually. He really was extremely good and uh, we're currently editing the footage and also I'll put up a link for his presentation later on today. My home thoughts uh, start with this picture I took as we were taking off from Dubai. And uh, you can see the tower, you know, the light is very, um, it's very difficult to capture Dubai from the sky because of the shades of the desert and the buildings. And my piece uh, over the weekend uh, was Kenya can be a major transit point like Dubai. Last week I visited Geneva via Dubai as I sat and listened to the destinations. I appreciated how Dubai has made itself an intersection point in this 21st century world. Absolutely any and every destination in the world was seemingly called as I waited for mine. I once characterized Kenya as a transit state, but in fact Dubai is the real transit state a connection point in an interconnected century. I have seen 30-year-old photographs. Actually, I was referring to a photograph which I'm going to show you now from 1991. It's not even um, 30 years. <coughs> and when you look at that photograph, you can see how Dubai was a blank canvas. I jumped to Victor Hugo's comment that there is nothing like a dream to create the future. And indeed, when you look at what Sheikh Mohammed has achieved, it's truly miraculous. Brand Dubai is one that we need to learn from. We too are a transit state, of course. It would be madness to take a tilt at Dubai, but we can carve out a similar position in East Africa. We are the route to the sea for a vast swathe of countries from the eastern DRC to Juba. This is the tailwind we need to ensure fills our sails. And for this to happen, our airports, our ports, our roads, our railways need to be first class. And all of this needs to be plugged into cheap power. And we need to do this now. But frankly, given the structure of our expenditure, recurrent in particular, with salaries plus allowances, it is clear we have simply not yet created enough fiscal space to do this. T.S. Eliot says in The Hollow Men, between the idea and the reality, between the motion and the act, falls the shadow. And we're in that place between the idea and the reality, and for the idea to become the reality, we're going to need to make some hard decisions. I'd been to Geneva many years ago with my family and I was staying in the Four Seasons, which is very Versailles, this time on Lake Geneva. And frankly, it's a pleasure to enter the Rolls-Royce world that Switzerland is. And the Four Seasons, you feel the prosperity every which way you turn in Geneva. Switzerland's status as a banking hub and centre of excellence has been built over many years. The dividend from being a banking hub just keeps on paying. We too have a sophisticated banking sector with lashings of innovation. There is no reason we cannot carve out a similar position in this part of Africa. 
I read a recent report where the authors characterized a key trait of 21st century success as being a quality termed global fluency. Global fluency is the level of global understanding, competence, practice, and reach a metropolitan area or any area exhibits in an increasingly interconnected world economy. Both Dubai and Geneva are globally fluent. Due to unique circumstances post the 2007 election, our narrative became truculent and extremely aggressive. This narrative has passed its sell-by date. It was certainly effective, well up to a point. It serves no purpose now. It's not fluent. On that note, I'll put up a photograph of Dubai in 1991. You can compare it to the one I took as we took off. And a photograph of the Four Seasons Geneva, the entrance, which is a very Louis uh, it's 14th Versailles type experience, but very enjoyable for that. Ukraine sets a European course after ouster of Yanukovych. Um, interim leadership pledged to put the country back on course for European integration. Now that Moscow-backed Viktor Yanukovych has been ousted from presidency, the United States warned Russia against sending in its forces. Um, acting President Alexander Tuchinov said late on Sunday that Ukraine's new leaders wanted relations with Russia on a new equal and good neighbourly footing that recognises and takes into account Ukraine's European choice. Russia said late on Sunday it had recalled its ambassador in Ukraine for consultation on the deteriorating situation in Kiev. And now battle-hardened pro-Western supporters are in control of central Kiev. Um, Susan Rice was asked on US television about the possibility of Russia sending troops to Ukraine, which President Vladimir Putin had hoped Yanukovych would keep closely light to Moscow. That would be a grave mistake, Rice said. It's not in the interests of Ukraine or of Russia or of Europe or the United States to see a country split. It's in nobody's interest to see violence return and the situation escalate. Um, uh, and then, you know, there have been a number of others that said it continues to be very, very fluid. Um, and President Obama is actually very hard-nosed in these sorts of matters. Um, I think he's used all the tools in his toolkit, um, particularly asymmetric ones, to challenge uh, folks who might not be too keen on. Uh, but I think the bottom line is I can't see the Europeans putting together a $15 billion package to replace the Russian package. And therefore, I think lancing the spoil conclusively is unlikely in the near term. I think Putin is going to play the Egyptian card, which is let them take charge, let the economy implode on itself, and then everyone will be crying for you to come back. I'll put up a photograph of Kiev and Ukraine. The friendly faces, the warm Sochi sun and the glare of the Olympic gold have broken the ice of scepticism towards the new Russia. This was the Deputy Prime Minister Dmitry Kozak and Putin's Olympics organiser. The games have turned our country, its culture and the people into something that is a lot closer, more appealing and understandable for the rest of the world. Sochi, in my view, was a soft power victory for Putin. Um, and funnily enough, I met Kipchoge Kano as I waited for my luggage at Jomo Kenyatta Airport when I came back on Friday. And I said, no, oh, where have you come from? He says to me, the Sochi Olympics. I said, and what was it like? He said, that those were the best Olympics ever. And I said, that's what I thought. I'll put up another photograph of Switzerland's Misha Gasser taking a warm-up jump for the men's freestyle skiing. Mexican security forces captured Joaquin El Chapo Guzman early, yesterday, early day before yesterday in the Pacific beach town of Mazatlan after trailing him since at least February the 13th. Of course, he gained fame in 2001 when he escaped from a high security prison. Um, he was the he was in, he had, he had head of the Sinaloa cartel. And some designers are going to have massive consequences in the trafficking trade. Interesting fellow, 
In tier 5 on a Saturday evening, he reportedly strolled into a restaurant in Tuma Alley Pass with several of his bodyguards, took his seat, locked the doors, collected the cell phones, um, instructed them not to be alarmed, ate their meal, paid for everyone in the restaurant, did that again, um, all of them carrying AK-47s, restaurant was known as Las Palmas, um, the man in the restaurant told those present the following, gentlemen, please give me a moment of your time. A man is going to come in, the boss. We will ask you to remain in your seats. The doors will be closed and nobody is allowed to leave. You will also not be allowed to use your cellulars. Do not worry. If you do everything that is asked of you, nothing will happen. Continue eating and don't ask for your check. The boss will pay. Thank you. I'll put up a photograph of it. President Obama, on a short notice uh, timeline, met with the Dalai Lama. Um, the Chinese Foreign Minister, Ministry were quite upset, accused the U.S. of crudely interfering in China's domestic affairs. Um, and it seems like this meeting caught the Chinese leadership by surprise, saying there was a double message. You got John Kerry on one hand saying you want to work with China, and on the other, you know, you've got. Um, uh, President Obama saying we're going to continue standing up for human rights. That's how this scene. I'll put up a photograph of the Dalai Lama in Washington. U.S. versus China is this new Cold War? It's a long article in the FT, which I've um, uh, taken down, and I'll just give you a few quotes. The new era of military competition in the Pacific will become the defining geopolitical contest of the 21st century. I entirely agree with that. Um, saying that Asia's seas have become the principal arteries of the global economy, um, yet two very different visions of Asia's future are now in play, saying the U.S. Navy has treated the Pacific almost as a private lake. Um, unwritten understanding between Beijing and Washington on America's role in Asia is crumbling. For the past 20 years, China has been undergoing a rapid military build-up. China has been investing in its navy in a very specific way. American strategists sometimes talk about a Chinese anti-navy, a series of warships, silent submarines and precision missiles, some based on land, some at sea, which are specifically designed to keep an opposing navy as far away as possible from the mainland. That's what I keep talking about, the encirclement, that a way way installation of the snake that I like, which sort of captures that idea of encirclement. So you can see they're trying to find with ways of punching holes in that encirclement. Um, and saying, you know, there's been a build-up almost every day, Chinese aircraft flying near the islands, prompt a response from Japanese jets. The world's second and third largest economies are playing a game of military chicken. With the world's largest economy, the U.S. committed by treaty to defend Japan. Um, saying, the besiegement looks even worse on a map, Chinese talk about the first island chain, a perimeter that stretches along the western Pacific from Japan in the northeast through Taiwan to the Philippines in the south, all allies or friends of the U.S. This is both a geographical barrier in that it creates a series of channels that a superior opponent could block in order to bottle up the Chinese Navy. Um, so when China looks out to see it all very quickly sees the U.S. That quote I gave you that I found in Kaplan, whoever is Lord of the Malacca has his hand on the throat of Venice, says that could apply to China as well. Um, so a very interesting article, but in this article, basically, you know, giving a lot of uh, emphases on, on uh, the air-sea battle concept. And that air-sea battle concept envisages a blinding attack, a bombing campaign over mainland China, and a sort of a shock and awe, the Navy's version of shock and awe for the 21st century. And my point is, you know, is this. It is crystal, crystal clear to me that the U.S. owns a decisive advantage at this point and that the hard power leadership is set to erode over time. Therefore, I think there is real bite behind the pivot envisaged under the air-sea battle concept. But that concept fails to cross the politically feasible threshold massive bombing campaign across China seems to me entirely unlikely unless China does an extraordinarily provocative act and I just don't see that happening. Therefore, this is essentially a very disproportionate uh, response that's being modelled by the Pentagon. Um, and I think it looks untenable. 
I think the more, far more probable idea is the idea of distant blockade operations, which is in that plan, the encirclement of China, effectively blockading the country, lighting up the periphery. I think the US can be, and probably is, China's gatekeeper. It's a chokehold. I think that, that is what this is currently about. The launch of a Chinese guided missile destroyer, Ziyang, last year, but I'm afraid of not that. Um, and I said previously, if you're considering distant blockade operations, one of those areas you will be blockading is this part of the world, given the amount of energy that is likely to be sold into Asia from here in the future. Narendra Modi has made some interesting comments, saying the world does not welcome the mindset of expansion in today's times. China will also have to leave behind its mindset of expansion, he told a cheering crowd on February the 22nd. I swear in the name of the soil that I will protect this country. We won't have time to think. He won't have time to think about China, said Banerjee, a retired major general in the Indian Army. Without any manner of doubt, the Afghanistan withdrawal is a critical question. If Modi takes over, that will be his biggest foreign policy headache. I think he's going to win by a mile. Uh, the president, apparently, Mr. Savini, is signing the anti-homosexuality bill today at 800 GMT. He wants to sign it with the full witness of the international media to demonstrate Uganda's independence in the face of Western pressure and provocation, said his spokesman, Ofwano Opondo. I'll put up a link for his Mindspeak session in 2011. He posted on YouTube. Currency markets. 137.38 euro dollar index 80.23 continues to trade soft Japanese yen 102.26 Swissy 0.8874 the pound 166.46 the Aussie 0 0.9870 and it fell after iron ore prices touched a weak low amid reports of property lending curves in China. India rupee 62.128 South Korean won 1073.20 touched uh, 1077.86 earlier, which was the weakest since February the 6th. Rial, uh, 2.346, and that rallied to 1.8% last week, and is at the strongest level since January 20. Egyptian pound, 694.53, and the rand is at 1094.48. Um, so, you know, the higher beta currencies have, have rebounded, but let's see how they behave around here. Dollar index, I'll put up a three month chart. Uh, it's at 80.23. In my view, that 81.06 level I previously mentioned is key. And until we cross that, hold above that, I think uh, we're going to see the dollar under pressure. Euro dollar, 137.38. ECB draggy said policymakers are ready to add stimulus <coughs> if the outlook for prices deteriorates, though there are currently no signs of deflation in the euro area. We don't have any evidence of people postponing their expenditure plans with a view to buying the same thing at lower prices. In other words, we don't see what is defined to be deflation. Consumer prices rose an annual 0.7% in January after a 0.8% gain the previous month. Their target is 2%. Bitcoin holders are offering the virtual money for $124 on the online exchange. MT Gox down from $829 two weeks ago. Gold, I'll put up a one-year chart. I think that's very toppy. But it's had a very strong uh, 2014. Prices reached 1332.45 on February 18th, which was the highest level since October 31st. And it's headed for a second monthly advance. Crude oil above 100. I think it's toppy here as well. Um, and uh, its prices are up 4.1% this year. Coffee, have a look at this chart. I'll put up a one year chart. You can see it's at a more than one year high, extraordinary rally um, since the beginning of the year. Sub Saharan Africa. The main object objective of attacking the palace on Friday was to assassinate the so called Somali president or kidnap him, said the Al Shabaab spokesman, Sheikh Ali Mohammed Rage. We sent well trained Mujahideen from our special forces to bring us the president, dead or alive. Only last week, the president had been speaking about how the noose was tightening around their neck. The South Sudanese army on Sunday said it had repulsed three rebel attacks on its positions near the market town of Bor, which is regarded as the capital, to, as the gateway to Juba, 120 miles north of Juba by road. 
Um, a petroleum ministry official told Reuters on Thursday national oil output had fallen to 170,000 barrels per day, even before the rebel strike on Malakal, and a dip of around a third since the fighting erupted in December. I don't think Humpty Dumpty is going to be put back together very easily, I'm afraid. I, I like this tweet by Carol van Oosteron of uh, UN and AU peacekeepers escorting a world food program convoy delivering food in Darfur. Mugabe at 90 am not going anywhere. Why should it retirement be discussed when it is not due? He said, the leadership still exists that runs the country. In other words, I am still there. When the day comes and I retire, I do not want to leave my party in tatters. I want to leave it intact. Mr. Mugabe claimed he is fit as a fiddle, but he appeared frail recorded televised interview. South African oil shares up 2.68% this year. Dollar versus Rand, I think probably the Rand looks expensive on a trading basis at 1093.12. I see the Rand coming under pressure again. Egyptian pound remains strong, obviously not Saudi, GCC, Kuwait support. The Egyptian stock market is up 18.14% this year and is at a more than five year high and crossed 8,000 uh, on Sunday. Morsi from his cage said the revolution of the people won't stop. Continue your peaceful revolution. The Nigerian oil share has been one of the worst performers in Africa this year, down 7.33%. The reasons for that are uncertainty, the central bank, the events of the central bank, his allegations about oil money going walkies. Ghana stock exchange up 13.71%, but you've suffered some erosion because of um, uh, currency depreciation. Interesting data about FDI into Comesa recorded an 86.2% growth in 2012 compared to 2011. Key country drivers were Uganda, DRC and Madagascar, 93, 96 and 85% respectively increased. I'll put up a photograph of African asylum seekers who are alleged to have entered Israel illegally through Egypt, lean at the fence of the Holop Detention Center in the southern Negev Desert. Longhorn Kenya, which is one of the smaller caps, but it's worth about $10 million, reported first half profit before tax up 78.199%. The analysis is there. The company said growth resilience has been fueled by bold ventures in the export market, competitively won various government tenders to supply school books in Malawi, Rwanda, Tanzania, and Uganda. KCB Group have uh, got KCB Capital, which is a subsidiary of the banking group granted an investment banking license marking the lender's return to the bourse after a three-decade absence. I'll put up a link for KCB share price. They're due to be reporting their full year results on the 27th of February. Um, Kenya shilling at 86.25 last. Nairobi all shares plus 1.31% this year. NSC 20 is down 1.84% this year. And there is a link where you can analyze any and every single share listed at the stock exchange. Once again, glad to be back. Thank you for stopping by.